Success to me is autonomy. I'm completely in control of my own destiny and completely in control of my own decision making. It's that simple to me. In 1994, a high school student in San Francisco, California had an idea. Ghazi Shami grew up loving hip-hop music and its culture, so much so that he wanted to pursue it professionally, but passing on college was not an option in his family. So he met his parents in the middle and enrolled in an audio program at San Francisco State. After a short-lived attempt to be an artist, and then producer, and then engineer, Ghazi combined his passion for music and his mastery of tech in his brainchild, Empire, a distribution company and record label. Since its launch in 2010, Empire has released a plethora of number one albums and singles, worked with some of the biggest names in music, and created a new blueprint for independent artists everywhere. And it all started with one idea. How did your parents' professional life inform your ambitions? Well, my mom was a homemaker, so she took care of us. So that was pretty amazing to have a certain level of nurturing that maybe not everybody gets to have in a conventional American household and modern society, right? My father worked two jobs. He had a chemistry job, USDA type stuff. He would start at like 5.30 in the morning, get out of there at like 2.30, and then we owned a, a coin-operated laundromat. And so he would leave his food job and go to the laundromat, and then he wouldn't get out of there until like 6.00 was very regimented. Like, my dad never missed a day of work. My mom never missed a day with us. My father never missed a day with us. What did you learn watching them operate that business? Integrity, accountability, um, respect for community. You would see him taking people's clothes out, folding things for them, loading up their cars, walking old ladies home. I learned from that. This is how you run a business. This is how you run a family. My dad was a gentleman. You talk a lot about sort of sovereignty and being in control of yeah. your own destiny. What was sort of the catalyst that made you so sort of focused on that? Uh, I'm Palestinian. So it all comes from who I am innately DNA wise, where people with no country and no rights and no voice. So my parents brought me to a country where I could have a voice and have rights. Seeing the struggle in my father's eyes from where he came from and what he had to give up to bring us here was a flame from the time I was like five years old. Did your father ultimately understand your vision? He never got to see it, he passed away. I would like to think he did, but no, he didn't see it. He knew I was different, but I think I drove my dad crazy sometimes. How so? Because he wanted me to conform to what he thought his blueprint for success was. And he knew that school was easy for me. I got great grades. Work was easy for me. I always excelled. And he just wanted me to have a more conventional life. And I, I didn't want it. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with a conventional life. It's just not for me. I don't, I don't want to do the same thing every day. The regiment is what gave me the backbone for success. But the regiment would have suffocated my success if I lived under the veil of regiment. So it was a good backbone to propel me forward. But at some point, I wanted to live with a level of spontaneous creativity that I, I could just do whatever the f I want when I want to do it. Was music uh, prevalent <clears throat> in your house as a kid? Very little. We, we had a lot of Arabic music in the house. Okay. But I didn't really pick up on American music until I was probably like six or seven years old. When did you feel a calling towards wanting to make music or be involved in music? Probably my freshman year in high school. I was at a friend's house and he had a DJ rig in his room. I was like, Yo, what the f is this? I so always had a fascination with electronics. It wasn't even just music. So part of it was about the music, but part of it was about the oh, gear yeah, and sure, the- yeah, 100%. And then it just set off a whole bunch of fireworks. We was up all night working on records almost every day. How important was the proximity of growing up, you know, in San Francisco to sort of feeling like 
there could be a path in music for you. It made it possible. Like by the time I was 17, I was bar backing at a club. One day, Black Sea walked in, and he's the lead rapper from RBO Posse. And I used to listen to RBO Posse every f day, <laughs> right? I'm like, I'm making this man's drinks. And the whole club is turned out to his music. I mean, I could do this too. It like instantly inspires a feeling inside of you that you can't shake. Are you thinking about college? Yeah, definitely. I don't have a choice about college. Cause Pops was like, you go to college, you get the f out the house. <laughs> he wasn't playing. He like, education was king in my house. I was supposed to be a computer science major. In college? Yeah, I had applied to UC Berkeley, got into Berkeley, and then I discovered that San Francisco State had an audio program. I was like, wait a second, they got a program about mixing records? So you I'm passed on Berkeley? That. Yeah. To go to, okay. What was the plan? The plan was pretty simple. How do I make a living? How do I pay my bills doing something I love? And at that particular point in my life, what I loved was making records. If you draw a parallel to sports, I didn't care if I was the towel boy, the general manager, the owner, the star player, the bench player, I just wanted in the game. So I was willing to do whatever it took to be able to make a living paying bills off music. You know, initially I wanted to be an artist and I was spending a lot of time cultivating that, you know, writing, producing, arranging, making my own records. And then at some point I pivoted and realized it was probably a little bit more of a foolproof plan to learn to be an engineer and a producer. There was only one engineer to every hundred artists or whatever. Probably easier to make myself a commodity and get my foot in the door doing it this way. At that time period, putting out music was just way too expensive. You know, you needed a street team, you needed billboards, magazines, radio play, manufacturing. So I quickly pivoted and I realized I could be more valuable behind the scenes than on the front line. And I was okay with that. I mean, I still always had the itch to make music, but I, I was okay with it. So what was the process to make that pivot reality? It wasn't something that I consciously did. It just happened. I'm in a studio, I'm working on a record for myself. Somebody comes in the studio and says, I'll pay you $500 for that beat. Man, I gotta make rent this month. It's yours. You know, someone comes in the studio, I'm mixing something, I'll pay you 30 an hour to work with you. I'm not worried about myself. I'm worried about making rent so I can keep my studio open. I had my first studio when I was 18 because I ran into some people at college that funded a studio for us. And then I worked out that studio for like three years, never made a nickel because all the money was paying back the studio. One day I just pulled up on the old man that owned the studio. And I was like, man, I won't buy you out. And I just maxed out all my credit cards and bought the equipment. That studio was in Palo Alto. I brought everything back to the city and then got my first studio on my own in the city. I think the most substantial thing I did at that time period, Game was in the Bay Area. Oh, when he, when he was doing those records before Interscope, right? Yeah. I was doing all the mixing and the arranging and put all the records together. Shanti did all the production and JT, the bigger figure, who's like a local. Yes, that's a big local artist. Yeah, he found him in LA. He came to my studio and was like, the first night Game recorded in the studio upstairs and JT came down to me. He was like, man, this kid is special. I need him on, I need him in your setup. We made like 25, 30 records together. It was like 19, I was probably like, I think that was before I quit my Silicon Valley job. I think I was doing that while I was working. You now have a studio. You're slowly paying off this debt. That was my night job. Okay. So my day job was Silicon Valley. I was doing everything from building computers to media servers to compressing audio and video and streaming music videos. I was able to transition to bigger companies, bigger salaries. Then I was using my day salary to buy all the equipment, pay off the loans, and start my first studio. Was there a moment that you knew your time working in Silicon Valley was about to be over? I got a call from Human Resources Department for one of the companies I was working for. We really like you, we want you to move to this other campus. And I said, what's my other option? And they said, uh, you could take a severance package. And then I immediately blurted out, severance. You had that confidence immediately? It was my chance, my chance to break away from the same theme over and over again. Enough money to pay rent, back to work. Enough money to pay rent, back to work. Please a boss. I don't know, this guy doesn't even know my name. I don't, just, I'm going out of here. I was like, I don't have income no more, but I'm gonna make this work. And um, I drove down to downtown that night, went in the studio, 
and I think I stayed in the studio for months. I didn't have enough clientele to fill in a whole day. So there was a lot of days where I just sat around twirling my thumbs, you know. How did you get people into the studio? Reputation just spread. Was there ever a moment where you felt like I might be too far out over my skis, like this, this could all go away? Some people have an opportunity to eat and are satisfied, and some people have an opportunity to eat and it creates an uncontrollable hunger. Every inch of success, I wanted another foot. Every foot, I want another yard. The more successful I become, the more hungry I become. I believe that I can affect more change the more successful I become. While his focus remained squarely on the success of his studio, Ghazi soon brought his background in tech and music to another day job, one that would ultimately lay the foundation for him to step out on his own. In 2006, he was recruited to join InGrooves, a music distribution and marketing company. And during that tenure, he would identify a white space in the music industry that would inspire his ambition to launch Empire. Had the InGrooves opportunity cross your radar? I got a call from the CEO. We're trying to acquire hip hop content and we heard you're the man. So I went through and I said, I'll take the gig as long as you don't require me to be in the office. What was the title? I don't really have no title. I got paid like minimum wage. To basically just be the hip hop guy? Yeah, I was making $3,000 a month. I just cared about having benefits. I'm looking at it, I'm 30. I got all this experience under my belt, but I kind of live haphazardly. Some months I'm making great money, some months I'm starving. Because it depends on how hard you hustle and it depended on what opportunities were available, right? How did you go from bringing content for them and having a relationship oriented job to then seeing what the market was missing in terms of, you know, this tech side and, and the distribution model. So InGrooves was a tech company by design. Some companies have the culture, but don't have the technology. And some companies have great technology and no culture. I wanted to create a happy medium of the two. I already understand the culture. So let me piggyback off some of the tech that they have, and then I'll spin off and figure out my own tech to take it to the next level. And that's kind of what I did. Most people didn't had no idea how to get their music onto iTunes or Rhapsody or Napster or any of those platforms at that time. They didn't even have no knowledge of things like that. I was real early on that stuff. I was creating access by sharing game. And I'm like, no, nah, man, you gotta do it like this. You got a whole bag of money you're leaving on the table by not doing X, Y, Z. I started to build my own software. And then one day I just left in grooves. I resigned my position and started Empire. You were coding your own software? Not me personally, I was diagramming it, and then I had a coder that was living outside the US and I was, we were on Skype all day long, like 16 hours a day sometimes. And how were you funding this? On a f***ing PayPal, with a credit card. I was just pay him, pay the credit card off, be like, I got a little bit more money, pay him again. I was working like crazy at that time. I had saved up enough money to get my first office. It was probably like the size of this room. I'll go to the store, buy the CDs, rip them, load them, send them to iTunes, cut the ringtones, send them off, call everybody, set up the marketing plans. It was like a one-man army for like the first year. And how did you even know how to administer like the royalty statements? Man, just figure it out. I always use the analogy of like Karate Kid, right? You know, he's like, wax on, wax off, wax on, wax off. You know, wipe left, wipe right, or whatever the hell he's saying. And, um, Danielson never understands why he's doing that. And then one day he just reacts, right? And so like a lot of the things that I was figuring out, I was just drawing down on so much knowledge instinctually. How do you choose what artists you want to work with? Like just on gut. Like, and then some of it is just like seeing an opportunity to take something from a B plus to an A plus. So you might hear a song and say, that song's amazing, but if I tweak the arrangement, it could be better. Song's three minutes and 30 seconds. I'm gonna chop the hook off the end move this bridge over and now the song is two minutes and 20 seconds and the skip rate is gonna probably be lower on Spotify. That's where creativity can meet science. What was your sales pitch to artists? Transparency, it was pretty simple. Hey, my, my contract's non-exclusive. You can bounce whenever you want. You can see all your statements. I have nothing to hide. That was like a foreign concept. If you try to cuff somebody, their instinct is to want to bolt. And if you make somebody comfortable, their instinct is to stay. The idea that you could leave at any time created a certain level of comfort. In my mind, comfort created longevity. And how were you finding these artists? Because this is before 
algorithmic. I mean, we were in the streets a lot still, traveling all over the place in all the nooks and crannies and studios and clubs, strip clubs. You know, wherever culture was being born, we were around it a lot. We would always show up places, people would be like, man, what are you doing here? What does every artist need to think about before they sign their first record deal? I always tell artists, it's not the magnitude of the deal, it's the economics. Look at the economics. What did the splits look like? What's the term? How many projects? What is your creative control? What is your recoupment structure? Do you have a re-record clause? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that can go in there language-wise that it looks good on the surface, and then you pop that refrigerator door open and you look inside and you're like, there's a whole bunch of rotten meat in here. I don't want to eat from this refrigerator. What were the first big records that you put out? <clears throat> the first, first big record that we had, single-wise, was Love Rants featuring I Am Sue, and it was called Beat It Up. That went platinum. Two big records by Sage and Gemini. One was called Shake It Like a Red Nose, and the other one was called Gas Pedal. Both of those records, I think, are double platinum now. We did a really big album that made a lot of noise for Kendrick. We did the Section 80 album. We also did Overly Dedicated, but Section 80 was kind of the one that poked through. How did you end up doing business with Top Dog and them? Uh, Nima, who's the CEO of Empire, knew KDOT from when he was running a popular blog called Dub CNN. And so he reached out to them because he noticed that they were just releasing their tapes for free on live mixtapes and that piff and sites like that. I got on the phone with Top and I was able to convince him that human beings are creatures of habit. Some will take it for free, some are willing to pay for it. You know, they want to be able to download it, put it on their iPod. They don't want to f around with download sites. Yeah. And so we did that and then the rest was history from there. I've had good fortune, but I don't think I've had any luck. I think good fortune means you put out good energy and somehow, some way, the universe rewards you by putting you in positions that you can capitalize on. How quickly were you able to expand from you in an office by yourself, handling literally everything, to having a team? There was never no like mass advancement. It's incremental gains. It's the Nipsey Hustle marathon, not the sprint, mm -hmm. from the very beginning. So it was every two or three months, save up a little money, get another employee. Okay, cool. I got somebody now that I can teach how to do contracts. I can get out of contracts. Okay, cool. I got somebody that knows how to pitch DSPs. Me and Nima don't need to call iTunes and Rhapsody and everybody no more. So we started to do that department by department. And then as we formed departments, I started to build hierarchy in those departments. Most people are building companies to exit. When you build companies to exit, you're dealing with somebody else's money. So the timetable to build the infrastructure is much more haphazard. Oftentimes, that's why a lot of these companies don't work out because you can't create a certain chemistry. So the most important thing for me was, no matter what, just don't f up the chemistry. So we did it brick by brick. Up until now is, what, 13 years in, me and Nima still interview every single person that we hire. Did the company operate in the black from day one? Yeah. How did you manage that? I don't know. <laughs> I, really, I really don't know, but yeah. People do it in the music space, but not often in the tech space. I did it from day one. I was running the company. I'm still mixing records. I'm still manufacturing CDs. I'm still doing a lot of little side hustles to be able to pay my bills. So whatever Empire was generating, maybe nine out of 10 people or a significant amount of people take those profits and put them in their pocket. I didn't. How long until the business started paying you? I don't remember, but I can tell you that in year three or year four, I was still only paying myself like three grand a month. A lot of my employees were getting paid more than I was. And how did you rationalize that? If the company thrived, I will thrive later because I'm the head of the company, like, I'm not tripping. What's the head without the body? Were you ever stressed out about money? Yeah, for sure, of course, everybody stresses out about money. But I wasn't stressed out about money as the same reasons that other people were stressed out. I was stressed out about money because I was like, I want a bigger office, I want to hire more staff, I want to build more technology. And then on top of that was like, how do I take care of my mom, my, my, my dad's gone, how do I pay my taxes? I live in an expensive city, you know? I was living in a box. I was living in 350 square feet for a long time. Really? Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's tight. Yeah, it was tight. Yeah, my clothes were in my trunk. I mean, we were getting number one albums and I was still living in that box. I never really thought about discomfort. I really didn't care. I just wanted the company to just zoom. Probably had like 
60 or 70 employees before I moved. Before I quit my Silicon Valley job, I remember somebody calling me and saying, why don't you quit your job and move to LA? And then I remember thinking to myself, man, that's f***ed up that I gotta move to another city to get on, you know? So I always had this mantra in my head that I wanted to build something in my own community. I always thought it was fascinating that I could go to LA, get off the freeway in Hollywood, and the Capitol building was there. And you could be a kid and look up at that building and be like, I wanna work in the record business one day. We didn't have that up here. I wanna build a building where people could walk by one day and be like, I wanna work there one day and be from the community. How did your vision for the company start to evolve from being just like a digital distribution arm to sort of a fully realized label? Being a distributor was always just a way to become a label. Labels put out less content than distributors. So in order to refine the approach to become a great label, I said to myself, let me be a distributor first because I'll have more content, I'll have more shots. You want to be a great free throw shooter? Get on the free throw line, take a lot of shots. Refine your approach, your mechanics, your mechanism. And I was also a distributor first because you need to release a certain amount of content per week at that time period to get direct deals with the DSPs. So as a label, DSPs wouldn't have gave me direct deals. Oh, you're a label? Go use Ingrooves or Orchard or one of these other aggregators to get your music out. I didn't want to use another aggregator. I wanted to be my own supply chain. So I built the supply chain first and then built the label second. How long did it take before you realized that you were on the radar of the major labels as a potential threat to their paradigm? I don't really think they ever saw me as a threat. I think they saw me as an annoying gnat, like a little mosquito that buzzed around their heads. But I think they probably were aware of my existence like 2013, 2014, we started having regional hits and national hits. It was rare that independent records were going that far. Having evolved from a distributor to a full-fledged record label, Empire has continued to expand and stack up wins in recent years. They've released music with everyone from Migos to Anderson Pack to Aaliyah, and taken their operation global, striking deals with artists from around the world. Through it all, the mission remains the same. Create lasting partnerships on the way to creating a lasting legacy. We've seen almost every label on a major scale maligned by at least one of their artists and really sort of revealed like a very sort of antagonistic relationship that exists between many artists and their labels. You don't really ever hear that about any Empire artist. Why is that? I, don't, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they're not our artists, they're our partners. So if you give somebody a voice in the room, it, it creates a different narrative because both of our voices are just as loud as one another, right? I've created a voice that resolves conflict, not creates it. And I always say, make allies, not enemies. Because at the end of the day, all this could go away, right? And if it did all go away, would you guys still treat me with the same level of respect? And I would like to think that people would still treat me with a certain level of respect because I always led with integrity. It's simple, like just treat someone the way you want to be treated. And I saw a lot of that when my father ran his laundromat. It's, just, it's crazy, you know, like just what yeah. kindness can do. People, people view kindness as weakness. I don't. I think kindness is just being kind. The major label paradigm is really predicated on 25 misses and one hit. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that hit on album number three or album number four, right? And which is why they locked people up for a six album deal. How did you make the economics of this model work for you? We do a lot of 50-50 deals and partnership arrangements, right? So that's 50-50 after expenses, basically? Correct. And I would rather be in repeat business with you rather than put you in a suffocating long-term deal. It takes longer to accomplish the financial success, but you create a better energy in the relationship. And oftentimes that energy ends up producing records that might not have otherwise been produced. So a lot of our greatest a &Rs are either attorneys that are saying my client is happy or artists telling other artists, man, I'm happy at Empire. When you get out of your situation, come over here. 
Is it hard to keep up with the volume? That's why we're a distributor and a label. At one point in time, the company was 100% distributor, and then over a period of time became half distributor, half label. And I would have to say at this point, we're primarily a label, but we're a label that owns its own distribution platform. It cuts down on a lot of the bottlenecking that maybe other companies might experience. I remember being in another label building and the CEO was raving about them getting out a project in 48 hours. I remember leaving that meeting and I was like, we do this shit every day. Like this is innate to us, you know? So what might be cutting edge for somebody else is kind of like what we do every single day. I used to tell people when I got my first gold plaque, I would retire. And now they're, <laughs> they're like everywhere, you know? We're about 50% of the way there. So we're gonna put in a swimming pool here with a waterfall. This room is being turned into a private club. So essentially somebody can make an album, sit, smoke a hookah, listen to their records and what it would be like to hear it in a club environment. We built this studio behind the trap door. So you pulled a bookshelf open. Are you gonna be able to like pull a book and then it opens up? Well, maybe we can figure that out. <laughs> But the coolest part about this room, you just flow into a private garage. Oh wow. Door comes down and you can walk right in the studio. So no one will you know. You don't have to here. deal with anybody. You don't have to deal with nobody. One of the themes that I keep seeing in everything that you do with Empire is there's a consideration for the artist and the artist experience. For sure. That seems baked into yeah. every decision. Yeah, the experience is the most important part. Tell me about building the website. I have heard that it's just very frictionless. Access creates culture, right? So you inhibit the access, you inhibit the culture. So my whole thing was, how fast can you get a record in the system? How fast can you get it out? There's a lot of companies that could do that now, but not a lot of labels that could do that. There's a lot of like DIY distribution services, DistroKid, TuneCore. So we were, we're kind of like the happy medium. We can create hits, market, promote them on a mass scale the way a major label does. We give you a lot of the transparency and direct access that a DIY service gives you. And there's not really any other company like that. Are there inflection points that you remember feeling like the business is starting to materially change? The friction's coming out of this. In general, it was things like records hitting number one on the urban chart, a record hitting number one at rhythm, then if eventually finally winning a Grammy getting your first gold record, then your second, then it's like platinum record, and then all of a sudden you're getting double and triple and quadruple platinum records, and then you get your first gold albums, you're chipping away at what people said couldn't be done independently. You're changing the narrative, you're changing the tone. You do have moments where 2015, you look back, you're like, oh my God, we've put out X amount of records, we've generated X amount of revenue, and then you're like, 2017, We've put out The Migos, Cardi B, Anderson Pack, Kendrick Lamar, Rich Homie, Kwan. You start thinking about all the different artists that have come through the platform. And then 2019, you're like, wait a second, I'm in Nigeria signing African artists that are worldwide superstars. And we're the ones putting them out, marketing, promoting, bridging the gap between Africa and the Western world. So you have moments of clarity that remind you of the leaps that you've accomplished. I move like 100 miles an hour and I don't stop to think about what just happened. And every once in a while, somebody will say, man, you gotta take that in for a second. I think I have a fear that if I slow down, somebody else will take my slot. What were the biggest pain points as you started to scale globally? Finding people who culturally are in tune with who we are as a company. Because of the type of music we put out, the type of uh, employees we have, we're a very diverse company, by far the most diverse company in the music business. I'm big on like inclusion, diversity, like these are things that are really important to me from an ethics standpoint, from an integrity standpoint, and most importantly, from an ethos standpoint. How have your roles and responsibilities within the company changed over the years? I don't have to be in the trenches as much as I used to be, but I still love being in the trenches. Um, you know, after we finish this interview today, I'm gonna go make some records. There are not many CEOs of major labels that are in the studio mixing records have to do it. The more successful you become as a CEO, the further from the music you get. And it's doing a few things like that here and there that keep me in the music, which is why I got in this in the first place. And I don't want to lose sight of that. And the most important thing to me has always been the music. The studio definitely keeps me really engaged. 
So where are we now? So this, this is gonna be my personal studio. I got my own bathroom, my own shower, put my own refrigerator in here and just be able to just work. Um, when I used to mix records, I used to shut the lights off, dance like a maniac until I was sweating <laughs> so I could be fully immersed in the music. It's kind of like a kid, right? Nervous, crazy in the classroom, send them to recess, they come back, they're calm, they listen to the teacher now. Got their head down on their desk and they're listening, right? So you gotta get up, move around, vibe, forget. Yep. And then fully immerse yourself in the music. Um, so yeah, I used to dance around like a maniac. Have you had to take on any money along the way? No. So it's still self-funded, you yeah. are the sole proprietor? Yeah. So you, there's no board or you've never had to deal with any of that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. It's incredible. It's a gift and a curse. How, what's the curse? Sometimes it'll be nice to bounce ideas off people that have some insight. How long did it take from when you launched till you were able to pull down a salary that you feel like was sort of market rate if you had been working in a I still don't major. have a market rate salary. Why is that? It doesn't matter. I own the company. Being an owner and an operator is a way different set of responsibilities. You're the CEO of a major label. You quit tomorrow. You have no consequence. I have to deal with all kinds of things that other people don't have to deal with. Paperwork, corporate paperwork, taxes. This is not being taken care of by a corporate veil. I have to deal with it. <laughs> It creates a whole nother level of responsibility and complications. So there's two ways to look at it. Does it make my life more complicated? Yes. Is it a lot more responsibility? Yes. Does it put me in a much more informed and powerful position? Yes. The gift and the curse, but the gift outweighs the curse. What do you think is the key to being a good manager? Um, listening to other people's opinions surrounding yourself with people that are equally intelligent, if not more intelligent than yourself. I want to hire people who are self-starters and don't need to be micromanaged. If I need to micromanage you, you don't need to be a part of Empire. How do you think you've changed as a CEO over the course of this journey? I've definitely become more patient. I'm a lot more calm than I was 10 years ago. Sometimes, when you're younger, you're a little overzealous and you'll run at the action rather than let the action run to you. If you're patient, oftentimes the window will open itself. You don't have to kick the door open. The door will just kind of open and you can waltz right through. Whereas before I was like, no, 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 now, 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 now. And I'm still like that about certain things, but philosophically, I'm more patient. What is the biggest challenge to operating in this space today? Not enough hours in the day. I wish there was more hours in the day. Cause I definitely like my sleep, <laughs> you know? And I think last year during the pandemic, we hired quite a few people when other companies were letting people go. I was acquiring talent cause I was like, there's a lot of good talent out there that doesn't have a home. And I would rather hit the ground running when the pandemic is over rather than to have to search for personnel. It was the first time in the history of the company where I didn't know a couple people's names. And that bothered me. Obviously, as hard as you work, you make sacrifices mm. on various parts of your life. What are the moments that make you feel like this is absolutely worth it? There's a lot of those moments, but one of those moments is every month when I send out all the payments. You travel across the world to places like Nigeria or Indonesia. You come in contact with anything that's connected to the empire ecosystem and they're like I've been getting a check from you for X amount of years it feels great so many people that come out of the startup culture they're building for an exit and there's a, correct an ambition to sell correct. and move on with their lives with a bunch of money here you hit the nail on the head that's exactly true I built the business with the idea of paying it forward and creating a legacy cultural currency and my legacy was greater than any amount of money that I could put in the bank to me it's more gratifying I mean, you have to prioritize what, what matters to you. Yeah, man, there's no feeling in the world like waking up with an idea, going to the office, having an amazing team that can execute an idea. So what does the future of Empire look like? I get asked that question all the time, and I don't really have a specific answer, only because the landscape is ever-changing, world economics are changing, 
I just want to go as far as I humanly can go, both for myself, for the company, and for the people partnered with the company. I want to go to the highest heights, whatever that is. And I tell people all the time, I don't have a job. I have purpose. What we get to do every day at Empire is create change on a global level. And if you would have told me at 14 years old that at this time in my life, I would have a company that has affected so many other people, I probably wouldn't believe you because it's pretty amazing to be able to do what we do every single day.